introduction. Hmm. Hey guys, I'm trying out this cool new app called Elsa, and it lets me practice my pronunciation on my smartphone, which I think is a really neat technology because before I spent a lot of time trying to refine my pronunciation, it was a really painstaking process. I try to read newspapers aloud, mimic native speakers on movies and my favorite TV shows, but let's be honest, I think the most effective way of correcting your pronunciation is to have a native speaker actually correct what you mispronounce. So technologies like Elsa are truly groundbreaking. Today, I'm very happy to meet Elsa's founder, Miss Vu Van, to talk about her personal life, her career, as well as the route she took to Elsa speak. I'm Tim Dang, this is IELTS Face Up. Follow me. So we're back on set, uh, but this time I'm on a slightly different capacity. This time I'm going to be the host, and joining me will be some very lovely company, Miss Vu uh, Van from Elsa. Uh, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me here today. So I think uh, first we will talk a little bit about Miss Vu's uh, personal life. And I think when discussing a person's uh, personal life, um, dreams and aspirations can speak volumes. So. Uh, could you tell me a bit about your dreams at the different milestones in your life, particularly, let's say, when you were eight years old? Uh, what were uh, your dreams? Um, I had a lot of dreams back then, but one of the bigger one that I remember and my parents remember was traveling around the world. And back then, of course, when you was eight, First of all, uh, you couldn't travel on your own, and second, the family won't be able to afford uh, to send you traveling abroad. And so what I did back then, what my mom always reminded me was, I always watched that little TV that had traveling around the world um, uh, series back then. And that was just my way of opening to the world and understanding what's out there. And as I got older, I kind of got a chance to conquer that dream that I had back when I was eight. All right. So, um, so you dreamt of you know being a globe trotter when you were like eight year olds, and did this dream change when you hit you know when you turned eighteen? Um, I think by the time you were eighteen, you kind of thought about traveling not just for the fact of like conquering the world, but it's more like traveling with meaning. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, up until 18, uh, I thought of traveling as more a means for me to achieve my new uh, dream in life, uh, not so much about traveling anymore. And uh, 18, I started learning a lot more about education and how it really changes your life if you had the right education. Um, I studied in Vietnam, but I think my dream when I was 18 was to really get into the top university somewhere um, in the world where I, can, where I can then get access to the best education, um, not for college, but probably for graduate degree. So that was my dream when I was 18. Okay, so I think for the most part you've kind of realized uh, that dream uh, you know, to a certain extent because uh, from what I understand, you attended Stanford. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, so you know, after you graduated, let's say when you were 28 years old, um, what were your new dreams? Because you've kind of realized, you know, the previous ones, right? You went to one of the most prestigious um, tertiary institutions in the world, Stanford. So how did your dreams change as you become more mature? I think your life goals changes as you get older. Um, I think you got to know more about yourself, uh, but I think the bigger part of me understanding about my dream back then um, was Stanford helps you understand what matters to you um, and why that matters to you. And I think uh, by the time you get to t late 20s, um, you don't go after the vanity goals anymore, right? Mm. It's not about resume building, it's not about having an impressive uh, track records of how many countries you had visited anymore. Mm -hmm. I think by then I really took a step back and trying to figure out what is that that matter to me and am I ready for pursuing my next uh, step of life. And I think um, being in the Bay Area, being Silicon Valley, being at Stanford really influenced me in the way how I think. Um, what can I do with my potential and my skill set that I can't uh, influence the world in a more positive way. Mm -hmm. Education is something that's really close to my heart. Um, 
So I think uh, my dream when I was 18, when I did my master in education and my MBA at Stanford, was mm -hmm. to somehow put that degree to good use, uh, working in education, using technology to really, really scale the impact of ec education so that it can reach uh, billions of people around the world. I think um, that was um, what I came to realize what matters to me in my life was to do something about education. So uh, your dream uh, sort of changed from, you know, uh, being able to travel to as many countries as you could to, you know, getting into one of the top universities and when you, you know, you're, you're in there, you were in the, you know, Stanford, uh, it kind of really influenced how you uh, thought about the world, your viewpoint, and it kind of uh, changed your aspiration and life goal a little bit, uh, which was, mm -hmm. which now is education, right? Yeah. And uh, so uh, we could see, like, the significance of Stanford uh, on your career as well as you know your other pursuits, particularly your career goals. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Stanford. You know, did you take a lot of pride in being you know a Stanford graduate student, and uh, was that challenging being in that you know really intense environment? I think not so much about taking the pride, but you are proud uh, mm. to be a Stanford alum, uh, being part of the network of a lot of people that had really put out a lot of efforts to do a lot of good things and you're proud to be a part of that community. Um, I think but what's more important is um, not so much about the bride anymore but what influence that it has on, your, on you personally, right? Mm. I think Stanford, as you just mentioned, not only just a career, a career you can get from a lot of places and you don't mm. need a good degree to get you a good sure. career, right? I think it's more your personal transformation. It gave you a new way of thinking about your life that mm -hmm. I think I'm, I, I, it matters a lot more to me. Uh, was that challenging? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, there are a lot of challenges sure. um, getting in, but I think it's way, people thought that getting into a top school is challenging and once you get in, that's it. Mm. that you conquer the world. The reality is getting in with just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. Staying in school and how to make the most out of it is way more challenging. Now you're being part of this network of people that come from the cream of the crop mm. in every single corner of life, yeah. coming together, everybody super type A kind of people, yeah. meaning they're super aggressive. They had never taken a no for an answer. They had never really fully felt in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so you being part of it, you just felt like all of a sudden, hmm, I'm not really smart anymore. <laughs> you started having a lot of self-doubt. Yeah. Uh, we had a thing, we call it a Stanford, where we said it's an admission mistake, meaning that the moment you got in, you personally thought you are that admission mistake because you won't belong there. Yeah. So I think the challenge on how you kind of get back to your own confidence that you used to have mm. uh, is extremely important because the moment that you lost your confidence, you lost yourself, right? Mm. So how do you figure out in that new water, getting back your confidence is extremely challenging and each of us has our own way of doing it. Mm. But I think we ev eventually got it back. It's just a matter of like how we got there and how long does it take for us to get there. Mm. And you're going against everybody else because by then you're really lonely, right? Yeah. Um, starting your own is lonely so you should have enough people to be there. Call you crazy maybe, but be okay with you being crazy. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Yep. So, so um, uh, did any of them give you a hand uh, in this new you know, journey? Every single of them gave me a hand. Uh, my family, my siblings, my, uh, my boyfriend, uh, all of my best friends, um, regardless of where they are. They could be from Vietnam, they could be from Denmark where I was uh, before business school. Mm -hmm. They could just be from anywhere. I think the way how they gave you a hand is they coming from different facets, right? Uh, either just emotional support that I believe in you, you really need that when you mm. quit something. Definitely. Every other day, you are the only one who kind of tell yourself you are crazy and you might not believe in you, but if you had enough people out there believing in you, you would be surprised how important that is in this journey. So either they just believe in you or they actually tell you how to do certain things. Um, lots of my friends also started their own company, so mm -hmm. they actually walked me through from the very beginning, like 
How would I incorporate my company? Where would I incorporate the company? Who should I choose as a founder? Who should I take in as the investor? Um, where do I even start? Um, so I think I would have not made it to where I am today had I not had all of these support. Um, and that's why for me, lots of young people asking me, when is a good time for you to start your company? Mm -hmm. There's never the right answer, but you start when you feel like you had enough people to support you because you will need, really need that in this journey. Yeah? Yes, and um, after you know, quitting everything and embarking on this new journey, um, you know, this journey called Elsa, I think our viewers are dying to know, you know how she kind of made it you know, with all the support of her friends. So we'll be back in a few uh, minutes to talk more about this new venture called Elsa. So we're back and now we're going to talk more about this company uh, called Elsa and from what I understand after Stanford uh, you know the school kind of gear you towards education so how did Elsa come about? Elsa um, was an idea that I had thought about a long time ago but not really pursuing it. Uh, but I think the main reason why I thought about Elsa was as I was uh, struggling with that English, I was looking for a lot of solutions to help me out, right? My friends were somebody who would always stop me and help me out, telling me, hey, you don't say it correctly, or hey, that kind of sounds weird the way how you use your English. And I would have to promise him that I won't take it personally so that he doesn't feel awkward when he mm -hmm. had to help me out. Um, because the other solutions I was looking for was either getting yourself a speech therapist, but it is uh, extremely expensive in the States. They would cost you between $150 to $200 an hour. Wow. Just to have that person listen to your, uh, your English and tell you where you are right or wrong. Mm. Um, so as a student, you, you cannot afford it, right? Learning to YouTube or videos or movies are helpful, but um, it is a one-way learning. So meaning that you don't have anybody to sit there and give you the feedback. And for my learning and the research in the education degree, you do know that when you listen to your own speaking, you don't recognize how wrong you are. Because after eight years old, um, unless you had an ear for, for music, you usually won't recognize the differences in your speech and the standard one. Um, especially if that sounds don't exist in your own language. Right? Mm. That's why like, Americans, when they hear our language with a lot of different tones, they would hear the same thing because yeah. it doesn't exist in their own language. So having a personal feedback, uh, like a friend to give you that was really important. And that was uh, what I finally decided to do um, to help me out. But as I thought back about that journey, um, later on, and that was a startup Elsa, I was hoping that many of us around the world would have that friend, uh, but many of us are not fortunate enough to have an American friend who are kind enough to be sitting there and helping you every single moment along the way, right? Mm. So I was trying to think, how can I mimic that experience for a lot of us who are sitting in different parts of the world, somewhere really remote that you never had access to an American? Um, what what could be that solution for people? And Elsa was kind of an idea that, that came to my mind is, as technology has gotten really good, um, and speech recognition technology especially has been better and better, um, is there a solution for me to use that to teach English? And that was the, uh, the idea of how Elsa was born. What were the early days of, uh, of Elsa like? Um, well, as you started out, uh, the first thing that you face is that you are really lost. You had 10,000 things to do when you started out. You just don't know what to do first, right? Mm -hmm. But in those early days and months, every single decision you take would really had an influence in, your, in the future of the company. So you mm -hmm. had to be extremely uh, well thought out about what you want to do. Uh, with very limited information. So that was a big challenge is how do you prioritize and pick the right thing to focus on? Knowing that every single mistake that you make uh, would probably put the company one month or two month delay mm. in the overall process. Um, the second part which every single startup would say as a challenge is 
resources. Mm. You probably had you and another person, at most three people, to start it out. In our case, we had two of us. And so one technical and then me um, as a non-technical technical person. So you just had to do everything, and most of that you don't know. I think initially I was really depressed knowing that oh my god, how come I make so many mistakes? Oh my god, how come everything I don't know? And then I talked to a friend of mine who's a vet, like a serial entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and he was saying that, just listen to this, 95% of the things that you do are mistakes. So it's your status quo. Um, so the 5% when you do something right, celebrate it, mm -hmm. because it doesn't come as often. And I think that little statement really changed my perspective and it really gave me a lot more faith mm -hmm. because now you know that you're not doing something wrong anymore. A lot of people out there also make the mistakes, mm -hmm. but they kind of figure it out and that is common. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of come to terms with that. You know that there's a lot of mistakes you make. Mm -hmm. What you need to learn more is that don't make the same mistakes as people already made it because mm -hmm. it's really costly. So I think those are the early days, but it's really fun. People say the early day of a startup is your honeymoon. Early day of a startup is your honeymoon. When you had that big dream, that big vision, of course you're confident that you're gonna make it, right? Of course you're confident that your solution is the best in town. So you had no fear. Um, and it was really fun to work on your dream, seeing your little baby being taken shape. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it is challenging, but it's fun. As you get bigger and bigger with the company, you had other headaches. You might have more reality to your solution. It might not be as rosy as you think anymore. Mm -hmm. Everything takes three times longer than you had anticipated. Mm -hmm. And um, initially, when you were building out the product, you think that if you had the best product, the whole world is going to jump into it and use it. Reality is no. Mm -hmm. You might have the best product out there, but if nobody knows about it, or they might not understand your product completely, then they won't use it at all. So it's kind of mm -hmm. die on its own. Oh no! So, I think early day has that fun part of being really naive, mm -hmm. being very optimistic, mm -hmm. um, it's challenging, but um, you don't have that many um, headaches to deal with mm. as you are now. Mm. That's really interesting because um, thank you for your very candid account of what the wild and early days <laughs> of Elsa were. Uh, because when you hear another entrepreneur talks about like his or her startup, um, usually like dreaded the early days right and talked about the challenges but you had a very positive mindset towards all the challenges so that was really cool right so i think elsa really plays a big role in you know bringing that about yeah so. yeah a lot of the friends saying that if elsa can understand me other people should understand me because <laughs> elsa is really strict and we are sure. because it's a machine right so it's as a human teachers you forgive certain mistakes and you kind of let go. Elsa doesn't because she doesn't know the sensitivity of like when to stop yeah. giving you the mistakes. Uh, so yeah, so if Elsa can understand you, I'm very sure that 80% of the people or 90% of the people out there would understand you. And if they don't, sure. again, it is their problem. Don't worry about it. Sure thing. Actually, the person uh, whose accent I admire the most you know, she doesn't speak, you know, American accent or British accent. She just has her own accent, but it's really attractive, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> accent becomes less of a problem. As long as you get, you know, the basics down, then yeah. you will be more confident. That's right. And we will talk more about what, you know, these touchstones of good pronunciation is in the next section of our interview with Ms. Fabu. So we've discussed a lot about Elsa, the application, you know, its early days and what it hopes to achieve, and that is good pronunciation. But um, could you tell me more about, you know, what is the importance of good pronunciation? Does it really matter that much? I think it is extremely important uh, when it comes to communication. Um, 
and there are a lot of research done about the importance of like pronunciation. Uh, a big one from the University of Chicago that has mentioned how speaking with a strong accent or wrong pronunciation really impacts your credibility. And in fact, when you speak with, with a really strong accent, uh, people trust you 30% less. Wow. And people do it unconsciously. Um, just because you say it with a certain statement and then an American saying it, and if you speak with a really strong accent, it's not fluent enough, people don't trust you enough. Um, there's a, uh, in the personal story, or a lot of my friends when we were at Stanford was they saying, He's a friend from Russia, and he's extremely smart. He's one of the geniuses that I know. And he said, and he speaks with really strong Russian accent. And he said, at Stanford, I felt like a kindergarten student. <laughs> but in my own country, I am that genius PhD smart yeah. guy. Because you couldn't really confidently convey your message. And a lot of the time, when you speak like with that uh, rough accent, mm -hmm. people think you are still trying to form your, thor your thoughts yeah. and your thoughts are not that smart, right? Yeah. So I think first of all, it really impacts your credibility. Second is it does have a huge direct influence on your income. And on the statistic from the U.S. government, people who speak English with really strong accent earn 40% less than those who don't. Wow. You can easily double your income or uh, also by just speaking really good English. And I think you feel it here too, right? When I was younger in Vietnam, and honestly, I walked into an interview, I would get that job over my friends, and I don't think I was smarter than my friend or more capable. I was just really thinking that my English was just better. Mm. And that's not fair, but that's just how people think about you. And so I think if you really invest in this learning English, and especially when it comes to speaking early on, I think it has huge impact in your lifelong careers mm. or just everything else in your life as well that people might have overlooked, mm. especially at the younger age. I talk to college students and they say, oh, I had to study my major and it's harder and I would learn English later on, or I can read already, why would I need to? When, what would be the next time that I need to speak English with another person? Mm. But you never know, because you speak English, the opportun opportunities will open it up to you that you might have never had it before. Mm. So I think it is, it is important. Even in the States, uh, people coming from the South would try to pronounce the yeah, way that sure. people coming from the West Texas, or the right. East. Yeah. For example, I won't call the names of the city, <laughs> but uh, it just because when you get there, they, they call it the secondary citizen. Yeah. Uh, and it's true to a certain extent. It's definitely not true all the time, but I think there's a certain ring of truth to that. Yeah. Um, that. That is important that you focus on that. I love the Southern accent, though. I love it, too. That's why I'm not like calling it out, but uh, it's, it's beautiful, but yeah. it is perceived less that's uh, just prestige. how it works, right? Yeah. Right. Just water, please. Double old Kentucky straight, the water back. You've got two backs. You sure you don't want to just make the whole bottle in a straw? Honey, there's the lieutenant governor. Let's go say hi. So um, it, it's really uh, it's really cool how you were able to elaborate on the importance of pronunciation because usually we just brand it as like a cherry on top you know you put it on after you've got everything else right the grammar and the vocabulary but from what you've said pronunciation and correct pronunciation at that is actually key not only to communicating effectively but also it has you know far-reaching uh, influences on your life as well, other aspects of your life, like your credibility and your income bracket, right? So it's really important. So learning English has been a big part of my journey growing up, and I must say that because of my English, I had got all of these opportunities that got me to where I am today. But it's only when I started moving abroad, and especially at Stanford, um, when for the first time ever, English was no longer my advantage, but if anything, English was my disadvantage. Um, I could read and write really well. I probably know every single grammar rules that an American would have never known. Like, mm -hmm. they just know how to use it, but they don't know exactly why I would have to use that grammar, right? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but especially when it comes to speaking, that's when I got a lot of challenge. And I remember my first month or so at Stanford um, when I was in class. And for those of you who are in the MBA class, you would know that class contribution matter a lot because grades don't matter anymore. You don't care about your grades, but what you care is how much insight you can provide to your class mm -hmm. and contribute to that class mm -hmm. uh, environment, right? So just like any other friends, I would raise my hands, I would contribute my ideas, um, and yet what I noticed was um, most of the times the professor would just acknowledge it mm -hmm. and then would move on to another friend. Mm -hmm. um, and then five minutes later, my friends would have said the exact same thing I just said. And then everybody else thought that idea was genius and they started jumping in and they said, uh, oh, let's explore more of the ideas. And you were sitting there thinking, why was that that I said something similar and people didn't respond the same way? Was that because I was female? Was that because I'm from Asia? Was that because I'm small? Should I speak up louder? Uh, but eventually I reaching out to people and asking them, what was that? What was the deal? And they were saying that because they couldn't understand me fully. They probably understood some of what I said, but not fully. And they did not want to embarrass me. They don't want to stop me and clarify. Mm -hmm. And so you had that incident over and over where you started losing your confidence again. As I said, for the first time, I lost faith in my English, which has been the bigger, uh, the bigger part of my asset, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's when I was really taking it seriously. I paid every single attention to my speaking. I would ask my really close friend at Stanford then to really sit down and really stop me every single time I speak something wrong. So here's how it works. Uh, Ms. Vu and I will take turns wearing headphones with loud music so we cannot hear the other person uh, what she says. So uh, we're trying to guess what he or she says by reading the lips. Okay, so are you ready for the challenge? Yes, I let's, am. Let's do it. So the first phrase is, you ready? She's ready. Hold your horses. One more time. Hold your Horses. Hold your horse. <laughs> that, that's good enough, right? It's good. It's good. You got the first one. Uh, the second one is <laughs> this is Vietnamese. Floating peanut. Floating peanut. <laughs> that's correct. Flowy. But not not flowy. Same. Floating peanut. Floating yes. bean? <laughs> it's similar, similar. Not beans. Peanut. Floating biscuit. <laughs> now you way off. Okay. Floating peanut. peanut. Floating business. <laughs> it's the same as bean. Can you say slowly? Peanut. 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 Peanut, pin, pin, pin. Peanut. Peanut. Yes. And Floating peanut. That's exactly it. La toy won't do it. This one's long. As cool as cucumber. As cool as cucumber. To ensure. <laughs> That's way off. As cool as. Can you say it slowly? As cool as cucumber. As you cool. Good. No cool. Like like cold. Cool as cucumber. As true as Q you cucumber. Cu cucumber. Cu as cool as cucumber. That's it. <laughs> <He's> good. <laughs> Ready? Okay. 
first word kung fu panda kung fu panda often <laughs> <laughs> Kung, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kung Fu Panda Kung Fu Tofu <laughs> Almost there Kung Fu Kung Fu uh, Awful <laughs> Kung Fu Awful Kung Fu Look <laughs> The second one it starts with an F, right? <laughs> yeah, second one start with an F. It starts with an F. Okay, that's good. First one is K. K. Look. Kung Fu. Kung Fu. Oh. Alright, second oh. word. Panda. Back. Panda. 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 Okay, I, I, I give up. <laughs> what is it? Kung Fu Panda. Oh, Kung Fu Panda! <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, they actually gave you this is an easy one out of everything else. Good, good luck. Thanks so much. Let's do right. the next one. Alright, next one. Okay, second one. Inside out. Inside, Three. two words. Inside out. Inside out? Yay! Oh, yes, yes! Okay, uh, next word. Taylor Swift haste sandwiches. Oh, that's too long. <laughs> they want a, a hard one. Okay, try it again. Taylor Swift hates sandwiches. As, as. Forwards. Forwards. Taylor? Taylor? Taylor Salute like when you cheers <laughs> <laughs> Taylor Swift as Swift Swift is good like Taylor Swift Taylor Swift okay. hate sandwiches as Swift as sandwiches <laughs> Taylor Swift Taylor Swift Taylor Swift and that's it no hate sandwiches Taylor Swift and sandwiches <laughs> Almost there. Taylor Swift hate hate sandwiches. I'm so bad. At this. Hate. <laughs> what is it? Taylor Swift hates sandwiches. Oh, Taylor Swift hates sandwiches. <laughs> I swept the sandwiches. <laughs> You're almost there. You're almost <laughs> uptown. Phone you up. Uptown. Uptown funk. You up. There you go. <laughs> I got the first one up top. I, I just need to finish the lyrics. <laughs> uh, no, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really glad to be a part of it, sharing the journey, and especially sharing my passion about Elsa and why I started this journey. Um, as part of this, uh, being the guest in this game show or this program, I would love to offer uh, the audience here some very special gift um, as you can use Elsa product. Um, as you know, Elsa is free for the first seven days, but for those of you who are reaching out to us after this program, uh, we will give you an extra 30 days for free so that you can continue to uh, practice your English. Um, and best of luck you, to everybody in your journey, and if there's anything we can help, uh, feel free to reach out to us. <laughs>